by God's grace and for his glory. This is Woodmont Baptist Church. Amen. Thank you, Lauren, for that beautiful uh, introduction today. Word of God speak. We are so blessed to have the written revelation of God himself, the life-giving word of God. This big Bible here represents that. And today, we're going to hear God's word proclaimed. We're going to have it applied. And it comes to bear on our lives. And the Bible says that when God's word goes forth, it does not return void. And his word is going to go forth today and accomplish what the Lord sets it to accomplish whatever he purposes. Welcome uh, to all of you for being here today. Thank you for uh, being here on the Lord's Day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If you are visiting with us and you want to fill out the connection card in the pew rack in front of you so we can get to know you and your family a little bit better, that'd be great. You can also do that online at woodmopbaptist.com if that's more your style. Uh, we have updated food pantry list. We want you to continue to please support our food pantry ministry. There are lists that are updated about what we need in both welcome centers and the north and the south entrances. Please grab one of those on the way out. When you're at the grocery store this week, pick up a few extra items. There are no midweek activities this week. It's fall break. We're taking a break. Uh, we're, we're seeing our Wednesday nights starting to grow a little bit. Uh, Lynn said that she fed almost 60 people the last two weeks, so that's wonderful to see uh, some uh, momentum on Wednesday nights. We're going to have an estate planning luncheon. If that sounds boring, I, you know, I understand, but it's really exciting, okay, because we have a 2100 foundation. This is a fund that we are encouraging people to make a part of their legacy giving. So if you have not written a will, we're going to have some attorneys present who can help you with your will, or if you want to adjust your will, we all know that we give 10% of our income, right, to the church as we tithe, but who tithes on their estate planning? We want to encourage you to consider giving 10% or more of your estate uh, to the church and uh, to the foundation specifically so that God can continue to do the things that he has planned for Woodmont Baptist Church well into the future. We have Fall Fest coming up October 30th, it's a Sunday evening. Invite your friends, invite your family, invite your neighbors, your coworkers. It's going to be an awesome event. Rachel has so many plans uh, for the Fall Fest. It keeps getting bigger and better every year. It's a great outreach event, a great, great way to connect your friends and neighbors who don't have a church home or who don't know the Lord to have them come to be a part of that fun event. I am here today. I don't know if you're disappointed that a lot of people said, oh, I didn't think you were going to be here today because they saw the email that we have a guest preacher today. But I am here, and we are leaving. My family and I are going to go out of town after the service. But today, we are here in the Lord's house, and I'm so excited uh, that Michael Kelly is back with us again. Michael is the executive director of the Nashville Baptist Association, and I sit on the, the board of directors uh, for that great group, 180 churches in the Nashville area that partner together to see God's kingdom come and his will be done in Nashville as it is in heaven. Uh, Michael went to Beeson Divinity School where I did. His wife teaches at Scales and uh, just a great family, a really neat guy. He's so smart and just a wonderful preacher. He's one of my favorite preachers in this whole city. I really mean that. And you will be blessed today uh, by him sharing with us from uh, Philippians chapter 2. So let me just say a word of welcome to all of you who are weary and need rest. I know a lot of you are. To all who mourn and long for comfort. To all who fail and desire strength, and to all who sin and need a Savior, this church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus Christ, the friend of sinners. Welcome. Let's stand together this morning. We sing hymn 58, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
Amen. You may be seated. Man, it sounds so good. Uh, just our, our music is so quality. Austin, that's a lot of bass notes to change there, but you, you're doing it well. Uh, Austin's one of our college students from Belmont who just jumped in and is serving. Uh, Aaron said that one of his buddies, he would never tell you this, so I'm going to tell you this. One of his buddies uh, texted him and said, uh, it sounds like y'all are using tracks in your worship because it sounds so perfect and so good. And he's like, no, that's just our talented team that we have here and, and choir. So thank you so much for leading us to worship the Lord of all light. I know some of you have a lot of trees at your house and you're upset about all the leaves, but I love this time of year. It is such an exciting time when the weather changes and people start wearing sweaters and we have campfires and uh, all those kinds of things. Football is a fun, a fun thing right now. And just uh, one thing that we're going to celebrate today, and along with this changing season, is changing seasons in our lives. When we have uh, something to celebrate, like the life of a child. So I'm going to welcome Molly and Chris Cruz up here, and little Oliver. Uh, please come forward. The Cruises, I guess it was about four years ago, was it this month that y'all were standing right here that we did their wedding ceremony here? Did y'all meet here? Is it, no, you met him separately. That's right. I'm so glad that y'all are part of our church family now. And little Oliver, if you do the math on it, he turned three on Thursday. Is that right? October 7th. Uh, so three years ago, uh, when he was about, you know, three or four months old, there's this thing that happened where we had to close the church down for a week, we thought, maybe two at the most, and ended up being a global pandemic. So we never got to dedicate Oliver to the Lord as, a, as an infant. And now they're coming back and they say, it's time to do this because in December, their family is having another change of season as they welcome their second child into their family. So uh, just love this family, love this couple, really neat uh, people. Chris has uh, served our country in the military and now he works with, with Gate uh, Precast Concrete and uh, Molly's a scientist and a researcher and just brilliant minds and just so neat to see them raise little Oliver in the, the knowledge of the Lord and uh, being part of our church family. This is Oliver William Cruz. Where did that name come from? Is that something y'all just decided you liked? I liked it. Good. Oliver William Cruz. We, we, our names are short, Jude and May. Oliver, you went big with all three syllables. This is a, a family, again, that uh, has been part of our church family for many years. You've been here longer than me, Molly, uh, for sure. But they have uh, grandparents here today. Karen Castile and Wayne Castile are here. And is, is anyone else know that's all the family that's here today? And they've chosen two verses for Oliver, and really one verse is for them as parents. Proverbs 22, 6. Start children off on the way that they should go, and even when they are old, they will not depart from it. And then for little Oliver, Jeremiah 29, 11, hear this great promise of the Lord for you. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God has plans for you, Oliver, and we're so excited to see how the Lord works those plans out in your life through your parents, through your church home. So what we're doing now is we're dedicating Oliver to the Lord. We're also dedicating Oliver to you as church family. We're also dedicating Molly and Chris to the Lord as parents and we're, we're saying as a church, we're dedicating ourselves to them as well. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, we read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down, and when you rise. So Molly and Chris, you have been charged by the Lord to uh, have these spiritual conversations in your home and to train up Oliver in the way that he should go. And so now I'm going to ask you, Molly and Chris, will you commit to raising this child in the love and instruction of the Lord? Will you commit to modeling Christian discipleship and growth at home? Will you commit to raising Oliver among Christ's body, the church? If so, say, we will. Excellent. Now, church, I'm going to ask you, will you commit to praying for Oliver and for Molly and Chris and for the new baby as they come? Will you receive this child into our fellowship and commit to loving him, serving him, through teaching him, caring for him, and giving of your time, your talent, and your treasure so that Oliver can grow in a strong family of faith? If so, say, we will. We will. Excellent. 
All right, now it's my turn. We're going to walk. Maybe Chris might go with us, but if Oliver wants to come with me, we're going to take a walk around the church. You want to come see Pastor Nathan? Can I hold your hand? Yeah, you can come too, Chris. And we're gonna, the choir is going to lead us in singing the truth about Jesus' love. Excellent. Well, we're so excited again to, to love and support the Cruz family as they raise Oliver and welcome a new child. Uh, this Christmas season is going to be special as Advent really becomes more meaningful to you as you await the expectation of a new child in your family. Let's pray now for this family as they continue to raise Oliver in the instruction of the Lord. Lord God, we lift up Molly and Chris to you as parents. We lift up Oliver to you as a child. We dedicate ourselves to this family and as we dedicate Oliver to you and to your people, the church. God, we pray that you would give them strength when the, the days are long, remind them that the years are short. God, we pray that you would give them discernment on how best to raise up Oliver. God, we pray that you would help them to grow in their own discipleship as they model what Christian conformity to Christ-likeness looks like in their home. God, we pray that you would continue to uh, give them good friends and family who support them uh, in this journey and help them to enjoy the labors of love in their own home as they raise their children in the way that they should go so that when they are old, they will not depart from it. Lord, we love you. We pray this in the powerful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Here's a little Bible that Rachel ordered a long time ago for little Oliver. This is for you, and it has your name on it. It's a New Testament. It has all stories about Jesus in there and about his love for you. Amen. All right, y'all can have a seat. Thank you so much, Molly and Chris and Oliver. What we saw last week in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, we ended and said, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We see that Christ is Lord of all, and he has shown us his love for us, the church, and that while we were still sinners, he died for us. So let's stand this morning and sing this truth together as we sing hymn 246, The Church is One Foundation. The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ.
What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can see. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hope. My shepherd will defend me Through the deepest valley he will be Oh, the night has been won And I shall overcome Yet not I, but through Christ in me I drink, I know I am the leader. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my body, and He was raised to a
Father God, thank you so much for the privilege of being in your house. Thank you for letting us gather in person. I thank you, Father, for the changing of the seasons, but I thank you that you do not change. I thank you that you are the same today as you were yesterday and as you will be tomorrow. I thank you for your new morning mercies. I pray, Father, for all the missionaries on the foreign fields and here at home. Make yourself very present and aware today so that they will be sure they are remembered. I thank you, Father, for all the ways you manifest yourself to us. I thank you for the people you put into our lives. Help us to be true to you, for you are our only hope. I pray, Father, that the path we are on this very day will lead us directly to you. For Christ's sake, amen.
Good morning. Let's pray together again as we open God's word. Father, thank you for this church. Thank you for this word. Thank you for this expression of who you are and what it is that you require for us. And now, Lord, we pray by your grace that you would help us to know you and help us to know you to the end that we might glorify you. And we pray that we might bring our thoughts, our actions, our whole beings in line with who you are and who you have called us to be by your grace and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And now, Lord, we pray that you would speak through what you have already spoken. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I said, good morning. So glad to be able to be here this morning with you and open up God's word. I'm so happy to be able to also continue in the series in Philippians that you all have have been in this month of October. And uh, so if you want to open your Bible and turn to the next passage that we come to in the book of Philippians, we will be in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 12, and we'll run all the way through uh, verse 30, the end of chapter 2 today. Let me read that for us this morning as we begin. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you to will and to work according to his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world by holding firm to the word of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing, but even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Now I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be encouraged by news about you. For I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interests. All seek their own interests, not of those of Jesus, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know his proven character because he has served with me in the gospel ministry like a son with a father. Therefore, I hope to send him as soon as I see how things go with me, I am confident in the Lord that I myself will also come soon. But I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, as well as your messenger and minister to my needs, since he has been longing for all of you and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. Indeed, he was so sick that he nearly died. However, God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. For this reason, I am very eager to send him to you, so that you may rejoice again when you see him, and I may be less anxious. Therefore, welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and hold people like him in honor, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up what was lacking in your ministry to me. As we begin this morning, I wonder if you would consider a big, broad, important question with me. And the question is this, what is God's will for my life? What is God's will for my life? Now, if you're like me, you've probably asked that question before at various stages in various moments. There's some that stick out really prominently in my own background of when I asked that question with a great fervor. I remember when I was growing up in a small town in West Texas and trying to choose between this college or that college, and I asked the Lord, what is your will for my life? And then I remember finishing at one of those universities and starting to serve on a church staff and being newly married and trying to figure out, am I supposed to go to seminary or not go to seminary? And again, I remember looking up in the sky and asking the Lord, what is your will for my life? And then 
Again, I remember finishing a seminary education and having two different opportunities to move to two different states, Arkansas and Tennessee, and again, asking the Lord, what is your will for my life? What is God's will for my life? Now, if the pattern of my own life is anything similar to yours, then it seems like the moments that we tend to ask that question with the greatest amount of fervency are moments when you find yourself standing on the edge of some significant, life-changing decision. It's a moment when you have an opportunity to move to this city or that city, when you have an opportunity to marry this person or not marry this person, when you have the chance to start a family or to delay starting a family, to change careers or whatever it is. Those moments when you find yourself at a crossroad where the road diverges in two different directions, those tend to be the moments when we really start to ask the question of the Lord, what is your will? What is God's will for my life? And in so doing, there are two significant problems with the manner in which we tend to ask that question. One of the problems is from our perspective, because when you ask that question, especially at those moments of diverging pathways, it is very rare for the answer to come back as simply as you would like it to. So that is to say, the vast majority of the time, God is not going to write the answer to that question in your alphabet serial or in a skywriting message in the cloud. There's not gonna be a red bird that lands on the fence at just the right time in some other fabricated scenario you have in your mind to tell you which one of these roads that God wants you to do. And it's certainly not gonna be the fact that you can sort of open your Bible at random and put your finger down with your eyes closed and it's going to tell you in those pages, Arkansas or Tennessee. So that's one of the problems with asking the question is that it's not quite as simple and straightforward as we would want it to be from our perspective. But the second problem is not one from our perspective, it's one from God's perspective. The second problem with asking that question is that we tend to look at the revelation of God's will differently than God looks at the revelation of his will. And to put an even finer point on it, might be like this. That when we come to a moment of crossroads and we start asking the question about whether God wants me to go this way or that way, to do this thing or that thing, to take this action or that action, we are generally thinking in terms of a destination or direction. And time and time again, when you look through the pages of the Bible, trying to discern what God's will is for your life, you find it expressed not so much of a destination as in formation. Or to put it another way, in terms of his will, God is generally more interested in who you are becoming than where you are going. And in that sense, the answer to that question is the same for every single Christian in this room this morning. What is God's will for your life? Well, God's will for your life is the same thing that God's will is for my life. It is to become more like Jesus on a daily basis. This is God's will for your life, regardless of what season you're in, regardless of how old you are, and regardless of what crossroad you might be facing that prompted you to ask that question in the first place. The answer to the question, in a broad sense, is always the same. What is God's will for your life? God's will for your life is to become more like Jesus, always. And this process of becoming more like Jesus is called sanctification. 
Now, the reason why we bring that up this morning is because this back half of Philippians chapter 2 is about sanctification. It is about becoming more like Jesus. And specifically, it's about three elements of sanctification that we want to talk about this morning as we work our way through the passage. And those three elements of sanctification are these. It's about the work of sanctification. It's about the evidence of sanctification. And it's about the examples of sanctification. This is what we find in Philippians chapter 2. So let's begin with the first one of those, the work of sanctification. When you pick up Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, you find that fundamentally, the verses that we just read are a response to something, which in a way fits, because really, that's what all of life is. In fact, you could say, really, that's what the Bible is. Now, sometimes we say things about the Word of God, like, you know, this is God's roadmap for our lives, or this is God's instruction manual, and don't misunderstand, the Lord certainly does tell you how to live, he does tell you about things we are supposed to do and not to do, but the primary purpose of the Bible is really not to show us how to live. The primary purpose of the Bible is for God to reveal himself to us. We have the Bible so that we might know God and know who he is and what he is like, and only after knowing who God is and what he is like, we are to respond. This is the pattern through all of Scripture. Broadly, you could say that the Bible works like this. It's going to tell you God is X, and in light of God being X, we are to X but it always starts with God. Similarly, when you come to Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, you find a response. So everything that we're going to talk about this morning really is a response. That's what the very first word of verse 12 means. It's the word therefore. Now, a wise man once said that anytime you see the word therefore, that you should always ask the question, what is the therefore That's right. What is the therefore, therefore? So the very fact that the first word that we read in in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 says, therefore, it ought to call us immediately back to what has just been stated so that we know we are responding to what. And what we find in Philippians chapter 2 through the first 11 verses is one of the greatest Christological passages in the entire Bible. In fact, Verses 6 through 11, if you'll notice in your Bible the fact that it's sort of set apart and indented, one of the reasons why that may be is because Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 6 through 11, might have actually been the text to an early hymn that the church sang to each other. Now, can you imagine that? People in the first century sitting in small congregations still trying to figure out everything that's happening in the world, and yet bedrocking their faith on these truths about Jesus and doing it in song. Singing to one another, not only as a means of worshiping God, but also a means of teaching each other so that we understand and know who Jesus is. And so you read through that text and you find these incredible truths about Jesus, that Jesus, though he remains God, took on the form of a man, and even though he had every right for everything to bow down and worship him, humbled himself even to the point of death on the cross. That's what Jesus did, but then it tells you where Jesus is right now, that because of this, he has been elevated to the right hand of God. And it concludes with the amazing statement that the question of whether or not everything in the universe will acknowledge the lordship of Jesus is not really a question of if, it's only a question of when. This is a promise that there will come a day when even the most ardent atheist will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, that is an incredibly fueling and motivating truth for the Christian because it means that as we move through this crooked and perverse generation, which is what the second half of this chapter calls it, that even as we do so, that all of the crookedness and all of the perversion is really on a ticking clock that there will come a moment when every knee will bow and there will come a moment when every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so for us this morning too, if you're hearing these words, the question is not whether you acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord. 
The question is when you will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. So what do we do in response to that? That's what the therefore is there for. That in light of these grand truths about Jesus, the universal eminence of Jesus, that he has been seated at the right hand of God and that everything in all creation will eventually bow before his greatness, his lordship, what are we supposed to do given that these world-shifting, glorious truths about Jesus, how are we to respond? Well, we are to respond by working. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The response to the greatness of the lordship of Jesus Christ is work. And lest we confuse any sense about the manner in which that work is to be done, the verb tense and the nuance in that sentence of working out your salvation of fear and trembling has at its core the sense of working at something continuously and unceasingly until it is accomplished. In fact, that phrase, work out your salvation, the original etymology of that term is actually a mathematical phrase. It's a term used of a problem being brought to its solution. Working it out, like with pencil and paper, until it's done. Work. Work continuously and unceasingly, and keep working until the work is finished. Now, in some ways, that ought to not surprise us, because the Bible in other places talks about the fact that being a Christian is hard work. Consider another passage from Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians. Don't you know, he says, that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who goes and competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last. Therefore, I don't run like someone running aimlessly. I don't fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Or this from Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race that has been marked out for us. Being a Christian is meant to be hard work. Now, what are we working hard at? Well, we're working hard at this process of sanctification. And anybody who has tried to be a Christian for more than about five minutes can tell you that it is hard work. It's hard work because we have undisciplined and unfocused minds. It's hard work because we have temptations of the flesh. It's hard work because as you're walking around in the world, everywhere you turn, there is something to look at that you're not supposed to look at, something to think about that you're not supposed to think about, something to do that you're not supposed to do, and in contrast to all those kind of things, you're supposed to turn and go the other direction, which is in a steady pursuit of holiness and godliness. And that is hard. Really, really hard. In fact, it's so hard that if we were only left with verse 12, it would be crushing. Because it is, in fact, so hard that no one can do it. But God in his grace has not left us with verse 12. He's given us verse 13. And verse 12 and verse 13 are meant to be read at a couplet, as a couplet together. So when taken together, this is what the text says. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. See, verse 13 turns the crushing nature of verse 12 into good news. Because verse 13 reminds us that when it comes to the work of sanctification, we aren't the only ones working. 
God is at work. In fact, when you read those two verses together, what you find out is that God's work in us is actually the basic activity. And the work that we do is only secondary. God is the primary worker when it comes to our sanctification. We are only responding to the work that he's already doing in us. We are the ones responding. In this case, God works in us, and the way that we respond is by working ourselves. Or to put it another way, maybe slightly pithier, that because God works in, we work out. And when you start to take those two dynamics together of God's work in us and our work out, it changes everything about the work of sanctification. Let me see if I can illustrate what I mean. Um, We have three children, and uh, they are are getting older by the day. We have an 18-year-old, we have a 15-year-old, and we have a 12-year-old. But when our children were much younger, when it came around birthday time, it seemed like, at least in those days, I don't know if it is the same way now, but at least in those days, the thing that we always ended up doing around birthday time was going to this restaurant called Chuck E. Cheese. I don't know when the last time you went to Chuck E. Cheese was or if there is even still a Chuck E. Cheese in these days. Um, But we would go, and it was always interesting to me the way that we would approach that. So we would would go, and as parents, we would say, guys, here's the money that you can have to get your tokens. You're going to play the games. But as parents, we always push back on actually ordering food from Chuck E. Cheese. We told them, we'll go somewhere else and get the pizza. You can play the games, but we're going we're gonna to pass on that. And maybe part of that was because we just subconsciously knew that the mascot for Chuck E. Cheese was a gigantic rat. And there's something unsettling about a huge rat walking around inside of there. And if it was unsettling to us, man, my children were terrified of Chuck E. Cheese. Which, again, sort of makes sense. It's a gigantic rat walking around a restaurant. So we would go, and, and it was sort of this game that my wife and I had to play because there would be, you know, they would be playing their games, and we would be sort of scanning around and looking, okay, is the rat in the house? And as soon as Chucky was in the house, we would have to sort of turn their heads and guard their eyes. Okay, watch out. You know, we'd move it, we'd move it around. We tried to explain to the children in those days that it's not a real rat. It's a person dressed up like a rat, and they never could get it through their minds because all they saw was an eight-foot-tall rat walking around people's pizza. But it's nevertheless true that there is a great difference between dressing up like someone and actually being someone. And it's true in this case. If you divorce Philippians 2.12 from Philippians 2.13, then you get the sense that all of this work that you're doing, strenuous to completion, the hard work of sanctification, is an attempt to become something different. And in a way, doesn't that mean that you're really just a selfish person who happens to put on the costume of a generous person every once in a while? Doesn't it mean that you're really a greedy person who has to put on the costume of a, of a, a giving person? Doesn't it mean that you're an affirming, uh, complimenting person that has to, uh, or vice versa, that you're really a self-serving person that has to put on the costume of a complimentary person every once in a while? You're pretending to be something that you're not. Without this link, we will always, always, always think of ourselves as people who act like Christians every once in a while, but we aren't really. But with this link, it means that God has already worked in us so that we might become something different. And that means that all of the work we do on the outside is really just bringing our outer selves into conformity with the inner reality that God has already changed. That's the work of sanctification. And that also leads us to the evidence of sanctification. As we keep on reading, it's interesting to me that after Paul tells us about all this work that God is doing and then the work that we're doing in response, 
He doesn't actually tell us a lot of things to do. Did you notice that? Instead of saying what to do, he sort of describes the people that we are meant to be regardless of what we are doing. In everything, he writes, this is how you are supposed to be, not grumbling, not complaining, blameless, pure, whether you are at work or whether you're at home, whether you're talking to a stranger or talking to a spouse, whether you're a preacher or whether you're a plumber. This is the evidence of sanctification. It's less about the specific what you do and much more about the person that you are and how you do whatever it is that the Lord has put in front of you to do. Now, that's not to say that the Lord doesn't care about what you do, because he does. There are some things that you cannot do in an a spirit of working out your salvation with fear and trembling. For example, you cannot go rob the convenience store with a spirit of working out your salvation with fear and trembling. But you can choose to go to this college or that college. You can choose to pursue this career or that career. Do you see it? There's an incredible amount of freedom that's here because again, what the Lord is primarily concerned about is who you are becoming and the way that the person that you are shines itself out in the various activities that you are engaged in. So let's treat that in a practical way. Let's say that you're at one of those crosswords in your life where you have the opportunity to take a new career, a new job, and that new career would lead you to a new city. So you have this crossroad in front of you. So again, here you ask yourself, what is the Lord's will for my life? Is it for me to stay here? Is it for me to move? And so you begin to pray and you begin to think. And you start asking yourself questions. Well, does making either one of these choices result in something inherently sinful. That is, am I still gonna work in such a way that provides some good or service for the betterment of humankind? Yes, that's fine, so now you're back to it. I've gotta go this way or I've gotta go that way, okay? Well, how will this decision affect my family? Will one way or the other affect them negatively? So that because I wanna take other people into account, okay? Well, what is the situation with the church that I could potentially be a part of? So you start weighing up all of these factors and you know what happens when you weigh up all of those factors, the vast majority of the time, you're back exactly where you started, still wondering what is God's will for my life? And here is the answer, whether you stay or whether you go, God is going to make you more like Jesus. And the way that salvation is worked out in fear and trembling is less about the choice in itself of whether you stay or whether you go. And it is much more about the manner in which you stay or you go. Do you stay with a spirit of perseverance, of contentment, of gratitude? Do you go with a spirit of faith and trust and proactivity to make a difference in the new community for the kingdom of God. This is how you work out what God is working in. It's less about the specific choice that you make and more about the spirit in which you live inside the decision that you have made. This is the evidence of sanctification. And then as Paul continues, he offers up what are almost two different examples of sanctification for us to see. In the last part here, Paul mentions two people, and in many ways, both of these men that he mentions are living examples of what Paul has just been saying, of people that God has been at work inside of, and they are now producing evidence of sanctification. Now, the first one that he mentions, we know about. Timothy, right? This one is famous. There's books of the Bible named after this guy. And Paul uh, uh, approves of him publicly here. He talks in glowing ways about him. He says that Timothy uniquely shares Paul's heart and feelings. He says that Timothy has a proven worth and that he has been tested in the fires of affliction and come out good on the other, on the other side. In fact, he says that Timothy is so valuable to Paul that though he wants to send Timothy to Philippi, he frankly doesn't know if he himself can spare him. So then he introduces this second example of sanctification to us, someone that we are less familiar with named Epaphroditus. Now, Epaphroditus also has done some great things. He was chosen from the Philippian congregation to deliver a gift to Paul. 
Now this in and of itself was unique because Paul didn't take gifts from many of the congregations that he planted, but he had some kind of special relationship with the Philippians, and so he was willing to accept their aid. But then in his visit to Paul, he got so sick that he almost died. Paul says of Epaphroditus that he's a fellow worker and a fellow soldier. It's a military term used of those fighting in a battle side by side. But then he also uses two other titles for Epaphroditus that somewhat get lost in the translation. In fact, he uses two words in verse 25 that he typically reserves only for himself. He calls Epaphroditus an apostle and a minister. This man that we have never, ever heard of. So here you have two men, one of much more renown than the other. One who pastored churches, the other who was just a simple messenger between a congregation and Paul, and we don't know what else he did with his time. And yet both of them show us examples of what the work of God in someone looks like when that person works it out. Two men, in other words, who shone like stars, albeit in different ways. You may have heard the story of a man named Jim Elliott. Uh, just to recap for you briefly, Jim Elliott was a, a standout academically and athletically in college. When he came to the end of his college career, he really had the choice of doing pretty much anything that he wanted to do. And what he chose to do was to move to an area of Ecuador to be a missionary and preach the gospel to unreached peoples known as the Auca. So Elliot, along with four other missionaries, began to make contact with these indigenous people. The way they did that was through a loudspeaker and a basket that they lowered gifts to a beach to these people from their airplane. And after several friendly encounters they had together, they made plans to actually physically go and visit the people that they thought they had befriended. And on January 8th, 1956, those missionaries were attacked and killed by a group of 10 warriors from the people that they were trying to share the gospel with. Elliot's body was found downstream in the river along with those of two of the other men. One of my favorite quotes from Jim Elliot was written in his journal entry in October of 1949, eight, eight or so years earlier, and this is what he wrote as an expression of his belief that there are some things more important than life. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Life Magazine published a 10-page article about the missionaries. Jim's wife, Elizabeth, not only published two books about her husband, but continued the work among the very people who had killed our, her husband. Thousands upon thousands of people were not deterred by the danger, but instead committed themselves to the work of the gospel overseas. In fact, as you look back on it, few events in modern history have been used more powerfully by God to send people into the world for the sake of the gospel than the death of Jim Elliott and those other men. Maybe you've heard that story before. Maybe you've read the books, or maybe you've read one of Elizabeth's other books that were written in the decades past. It's a familiar story, Jim Elliot, but have you heard of Bert? I had not, but thanks to a message given by Randy Alcorn some 50 years after the men died on the beach in Ecuador, I know that story too. See, Bert is Jim Elliot's older brother. He's the one that isn't famous. In 1949, Bert was a student at Multnomah Bible College, and he and his young wife were invited by a missionary to come to Peru and join their work there. And other than an occasional furlough back to the United States, that's where they stayed. According to Alcorn, if you Google Bert Elliott, you will find less than 70 entries. But over the years, Bert and Colleen Elliott have planted more than 170 churches. And when asked to reflect on his brother Jim, Bert's response is stirring. He said, my brother Jim and I took different paths. He was a great meteor streaking across the sky. But Bert was not. 
Nobody lined up with their telescopes to watch Bert's life. Instead, as Alcorn puts it, Bert was the faint star in the distance that faithfully rises night after night, always there, always faithful, always doing the same comparatively boring thing. And in the kingdom of God, there is the need for both kinds of stars. There's a great need for streaking meteors, but most of us will not be that. Instead, we will be the faint stars. Husbands, fathers, wives, mothers, accountants, teachers, business people, students, we're the ones who will go through life day after day doing very much the same thing tomorrow that we did on Friday. And yet, we shine like stars. We shine not because of great deeds, but because of the work of God within us and because of our commitment to work out what God is working in. Not just to do, but to be the kinds of people that God has for us to be. May it be so. Let's pray together to that end this morning. Father, we pray that in your grace, you would help us to be. Help us to recognize that regardless of what specific call you might put on any one of our lives, that today, today, what you want from us is to become more like Jesus. And we pray that we would not become so fixated on the destination that we neglect this inward call. May it be so. Help us to embrace the work that you are doing even now within us and then help us to work it out with fear and trembling. We pray that it would be so in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, we have heard God's word clearly proclaimed today. You've heard about God's saving work within us that we now work out as we go from this place. We're going to have a time of response now. And if you've never accepted the free gift of salvation that God offers to us through Jesus Christ, his son. Michael gave us an evangelistic call earlier when he said the question isn't whether you will acknowledge Jesus as Lord or not. It's a question of when, not if. So if you have not done that and you're ready to say today, I acknowledge for the first time that Jesus is Lord, that he is master of my heart, of my life, of my body, of all that I am and all that I will be, of my past, present, and future. If you're ready to do that today, there's no better time than right now. I'll, come, uh, I'll be right here and you can come talk to me about it right now. Maybe you're ready to join Woodmont and you say, I, I've kind of been doing this whole Christian sanctification, working out my faith on my own, and I know that I need a team, I need a family in which to grow and be sanctified. You can't do it alone. Uh, we work out our salvation in fear and trembling together as the body of Christ. And if you're ready to be a part of that work here at Woodmont, we'd love to talk to you about what that means to be a member. Whatever it is that you need to do in your heart today with the Lord, uh, let's use this time appropriately to respond to the word that we've just heard about working out our salvation in fear and in proper reverence with a trembling, aware of who God is because of his word and aware of who we are in our great need. Let's stand and sing together. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Make my life useful to Thee. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Make my life useful to Thee. Take my life. Teach me, Lord, take my life, teach me, Lord, make my life useful to Thee. 
Take my life, teach me, Lord. Take my life, teach me, Lord. Make my life useful to Thee. Here am I, send me, Lord. Here am I, send me, Lord. Make my life. That's all of our prayer today, that we can ask God and say, we're here, we're available now, let us go out and shine like stars, uh, as he has called you and me to be. Some of you are those meteors that I, I know, uh, some of you definitely are that, but for the rest of us, let's be those faithful stars that rise to do their job every night, faithfully in the sky. Thank you so much, Michael, again, for being here. What a, he, you can see, is one of my favorite preachers, for a good reason, uh, and, and he says a lot of the same things that, that I hear in my circles, and I think it's so important. He's a gospel-centered, Bible-centered uh, kind of guy. I'm excited about the future of Nashville Baptist. Uh, excited for the future of the Cruz family. So excited for Oliver and for uh, him being a big brother soon in a couple months. Uh, we had a great time of men's fellowship yesterday at our breakfast and got to hear from Tom Morlock about his life story and just uh, really grateful for the men who we have who serve as examples to my boys and uh, to the rest of our church family. It is a special day today. Today is the one-year anniversary of Trevor and Rebecca Prather. Happy anniversary to you guys. One year ago exactly, we were hanging out in Michigan and uh, up in Frankfurt, Michigan. It was beautiful. If you've never been, it's so cool. What a wonderful uh, weekend and celebration that was with your wonderful families. Anything else that I'm missing? Great. All right. Thank you for being here today. Let's bow our heads for a word of benediction. And now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole soul and spirit and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. Go in peace. This has been the live broadcast of Woodmont Baptist Church. If you would like to know more about the people and programs at Woodmont, or if you would like to stream both live and pre-recorded services, go to woodmontbaptist.com or call us at 615-297-5303. This program is funded by the members and supporters of Woodmont Baptist Church and is produced by Woodmont Baptist Television. Thanks for watching.